So, in the year 2000, Disney launched the Disney Princess brand. Imagine you were a Disney princess. I swear this is connected to Tinkerbell, just bear with me. <laughs> so if you didn't know, Disney princesses weren't always marketed together as a group. They would release a movie, release merchandise for that movie, and then move on to the next movie. So you couldn't just like go to Target and find a bunch of Disney princess dolls and lunch boxes with the princesses on them. So the story goes that Andrew Mooney, who was a former Nike executive, became the head of Disney consumer products. They are the branch of Disney that is in charge of the merchandising. And the way he tells it, he went to go see a Disney on Ice show. And all the little girls were wearing like generic knockoff brand princess costumes, but not like Disney branded princess dresses because Disney did not sell those. And Andrew thought, hold on, they should be buying this stuff from us. This is a huge missed opportunity. These little girls are going to like anything with the princesses on them and the parents are going to buy it. We should put all the Disney princesses together and market them as their own brand. And this was actually met with a lot of resistance from the Disney executives, specifically Roy E. Disney, Walt's nephew. So there was Walt and Walt's brother Roy, who was very involved in the company, and then Roy's son, who was also named Roy, and he was an executive at the company. And Roy was concerned that this would cheapen the Disney brand and like weaken all the princesses' individual mythologies. Because Disney has this concept of character integrity. So all the depictions of a Disney character should reflect them accurately and respect their source material as though they are a real person who actually exists. So the idea was that like, you couldn't put Snow White and Jasmine together on a t-shirt because they're from different movies and they haven't met each other and they don't know each other because they're in like entirely separate universes. Disney has sort of relaxed these rules in recent years, I think because they realized that having the princesses all be best friends is more fun and marketable and no one actually cares. But at the time they were much more strict. So the compromise for the Disney princess brand was that the princesses would be next to each other, but not actually interacting. So not touching, not making eye contact. And often they're depicted in what's come to be called this pink void, because if they're all in an environment together, like they're all in a castle together, that implies that they're all in the same place and thus actually next to each other and thus interacting. So the Disney princess brand released and became a multi-billion dollar franchise. And like, obviously in hindsight, the Disney princess brand is genius because it allows Disney to make money off of characters they already have who were already successful and well-liked individually. And it's super low risk because they didn't have to develop anything new. So like the new live action Disney movies, they still have to like spend millions of dollars to make a movie versus the Disney princess brand, where all they had to do was print the same couple illustrations of like Ariel and Sleeping Beauty on like backpacks and pajamas. One weird thing about the Disney princess brand is that they launched it without really doing any marketing or any focus group testing. And so it took them a few years to figure out what sold well and fine tune the brand. So for example, the lineup of who was an official Disney princess took a little while to figure out. Esmeralda from Hunchback, was originally part of the lineup. She got booted out pretty quickly. And Tinkerbell was originally an official Disney princess. She was pretty quickly removed. It's a very one of these things is not like the other situation. The rest of the princesses are human women who were the main character or at least a lead character in a theatrically released movie with catchy songs in it. Tinkerbell is a human looking magical being who is not human sized and she is a sidekick who literally never speaks. Tinkerbell is a very interesting character because she was mostly used in the Disney company as like a symbol of the brand. So she would be like in DVD intros and flying over the castle in the Disney parks and animated into the Walt Disney shows. But she wasn't like a character like the princesses are so much as like a magical pinup girl. So little girls didn't care about Tinkerbell the same way that they cared about like Ariel. So Tinkerbell got kicked out of the princesses. But then Andrew Mooney decided that Tinkerbell should get her own franchise. He is quoted as saying, 
we were fundamentally missing an opportunity in terms of getting Tinkerbell out there as a character. There's clearly latent demand. And he said that he thought that the Disney Fairies franchise could be as big as the princesses. I believe there had been pitches and concept art for a Disney Fairies franchise as far back as like 2001. According to artist Lisa Temming on her portfolio website, the Disney Consumer Products toy division was trying to develop a more diverse doll line inspired by Disney characters. This would have been a cast of original characters set in an existing Disney property. So from a character integrity perspective, the characters could interact because they all exist in the same universe. Their ideas were either Ariel and a bunch of mermaid friends or Tinkerbell and a bunch of fairy friends. And years later, Andrew Mooney thought that Tinkerbell could be marketable, so they started to develop a Disney Fairies brand. And so the idea of Disney Fairies was taken to Disney Publishing in 2004, and they asked Disney Publishing to develop a novel that would sort of flesh out the characters and promote them. And so Disney Publishing hired award-winning children's novelist Gail Carson Levine, and the first Disney Fairies book was released in 2005, and it was called Fairy Dust and the Quest for the Egg. And so there ended up being a trilogy of Gail Carson Levine fairy books, a spin-off chapter book series, a line of fashion dolls, and other toys like miniature play sets and stuff. And this was all pre-Tinkerbell movie, so all of this was out before there was any Tinkerbell movie out. The Disney Fairies books and the tie-in merchandise is sort of like the first generation of the Disney Fairies brand. Here's a brief explanation of the lore of the Disney Fairies books, because I'm going to be referencing it later. The books take place after the events of Peter Pan. Tinkerbell has stopped hanging out with him because she felt like he was taking her for granted. And so she has gone back to live with the other fairies in Neverland, because Tinkerbell isn't the only fairy. There's a whole society of fairies who live together in Neverland in a magical world called Pixie Hollow. They live together inside of a tree called the Home Tree, and they have a fairy queen named Queen Clarion. The fairies spend their day to day doing chores to make sure everything in the world runs smoothly. So like growing food and making repairs, that kind of thing. And they also help take care of the nature in Pixie Hollow. So making sure the plants and the animals are all happy. Pixie Dust comes from a wise magic bird named Mother Dove. Mother Dove is the source of all magic in Neverland and she was born of a fire that destroyed Neverland. Her feathers are collected when she molts and then ground up into Pixie Dust. Fairies use Pixie Dust to fly and to perform magic. Different groups of fairies have different magical abilities, which are called talents. So for example, Tinkerbell is a Tinker Talent Fairy, so she can use magic to fix things and invent things. The Gail Carson Levine books follow the fairies going on quests to protect Pixie Hollow from some external threat, and the chapter books follow the day-to-day -day problems of a bunch of different fairies with a bunch of different talents. And these books did really well. I owned, still own, basically all of them. And so while this book franchise was happening, they started work on a direct-to-DVD movie that would sort of expand the reach of the franchise. And then this is where the story starts to get a little bit complicated, because the making of this first Tinkerbell movie was a disaster. It took a lot longer than it was supposed to, it cost way more than it was supposed to, and it went through a ton of different versions that all got scrapped. And so I would like to try and piece together what happened behind the scenes and try to figure out what this original version of Tinkerbell would have looked like. So I can't find out when production on the first Tinkerbell movie began. I think it was probably around 2004 when the franchise first got started and just animated movies take longer than books, but I'm not sure on that. But what I do know for sure is that in mid 2006, Disney announced at the New York licensing fair that they had cast Clueless star Brittany Murphy to voice Tinkerbell in an upcoming movie. And the movie was going to be direct-to-video and made at Disney Toon Studios, which was run by Sharon Morrill. Disney Toon Studios was founded in 1990 as sort of a division of Disney's television animation before it sort of broke off, and they specialized in direct-to-video Disney sequels. And these direct-to-video Disney sequels have a reputation of being cash grabs with pointless storylines and cheap animation. The word cheap quills came up a lot while I was researching Disney Toon. But like, for context, 
This was when Michael Eisner was CEO of the Disney company. An anonymous source at Disney Toon claimed that years ago, Michael Eisner told Sharon Morrill and Feature Animation that he no longer wanted to be beholden to animators. So he told them from then on, all quote, creative decisions would be made by his managers and executives. So these direct-to-video sequels were always intended to be mediocre cash grabs. And to be fair, they were very successful mediocre cash grabs. They were very cheap to make, usually between like five and $15 million, and they would make tens of millions of dollars in video sales. Return of Jafar was the first direct-to-video sequel. It cost around $3 million to make and made over $100 million in video sales. So Disney Toon Studios was Michael Eisner's money-making machine, which he had a lot of projects that were not money-making machines. However, in 2004, Michael Eisner was voted out as chairman of the company. Michael Eisner, I believe, was both CEO of the company and chairman of the company. Basically, he was booted out because of a coup started by Roy E. Disney, who convinced 43% of shareholders to vote against Eisner because Roy did not like the direction Eisner was taking the company. My dad, my uncle, and those that followed have created an amazing legacy that has touched people around the world for generations. Lately, though, I've become concerned with the direction in which the Disney company is moving. I believe it's time to take action, and we could use your help. If you're a Disney shareholder, in my view, the best way to help save Disney is to vote no on the re-election of Michael Eisner, George Mitchell, Judith Estrin, and John Bryson. I believe a new day is dawning for the Walt Disney Company, and with your help, we can bring back the magic. Roy said that under Eisner, Disney has become a soulless conglomerate, always looking for a quick buck. Remember the cash grab sequels and the Disney Princess brand? Roy did not like those. So because he was voted out as chairman, Eisner then also stepped down as CEO in 2005 and he was replaced by Bob Iger. One of the first things Bob Iger did as CEO was the Pixar merger. At the beginning of 2006, Disney acquired Pixar for $7 billion. And as part of this merger, Pixar vice president John Lasseter was appointed chief creative officer of the Disney Animation Studios. A brief career history of John Lasseter. Lasseter worked at Disney, but was fired. Then he got a job at Lucasfilm, but then that division of Lucasfilm was bought by Steve Jobs and turned into Pixar. While at Pixar, Laster had directed Toy Story, A Bug's Life, Toy Story 2, and Cars, which was set to come out later in 2006. Laster had become vice president of Pixar, and so then when the Pixar merger happened, he was made the head of Walt Disney Feature Animation. So he oversaw all of Walt Disney Animation Studios' projects as executive producer. So he was not technically in charge of the Disney Toon Studio, but it was like under his umbrella. And I think he was also in charge of how the Disney characters were portrayed. So, Laster hated the direct-to-video movies. He thought they were cheap and made Disney look bad. So he canceled a lot of direct-to-video projects that were in development. This included Dumbo 2, The Aristocats 2, Chicken Little 2, colon, The Ugly Duckling Story, Meet the Robinsons 2, colon, First Date, Mulan 3, The Seven Dwarves, and a planned series called Disney Princess Enchanted Tales. They had basically already finished the first one, so they released that, but then they canceled the subsequent ones. So to recap, at this point, the guy who loves cheap cash grabs is out, and there's a new guy who hates cheap cash grabs, who now oversees the studio that exclusively makes cheap cash grabs. So Disney Toon Studios was in trouble. And so was the Tinkerbell movie. So there were multiple different drafts that happened over the course of this project, and it's kind of confusing, so I hope I have this all right. First, there was a short-lived 2D version of the Tinkerbell movie, but at some point, Sharon Morrill and the then president of Walt Disney Feature Animation, before he got replaced by Laster, agreed that 2D was out and 3D was in. So they scrapped all the 2D work and started over in 3D. I don't know how far into it they had gotten with the 2D. I don't think it was that far. But then they started on a CGI animated movie that initially had the working title Tinkerbell and the Ring of Belief. At some point they started calling it just Tinkerbell, but 
I'm going to be calling this version the Ring of Belief just so that it's clear what I'm talking about. And so they got very far into this movie. Like, they got so close that there were previews of the movie on Disney DVDs. You know, the like, coming soon to own on DVD and video. That thing. So like, Disney DVDs that came out at that time had trailers for this Tinkerbell movie. Which means that we have some finished pieces of animation from these trailers. So if it was coming soon, why did it never come out? So, Disney Toons started working on Ring of Belief. And at the beginning of this process, they went through like a dozen directors and two dozen scripts because Sharon Morrill kind of had a vision for what she wanted this project to be. And she was heavily involved and kept shooting down different ideas. I don't think she wrote the script, but I think a lot of elements of the plot were her idea. So they did a lot of concept art and storyboards for it, a lot of which has been made public over the years. We're gonna talk about it. And then mid-2006, they make the project public and announce that they are casting Brittany Murphy. And then at some point after that, they sent the project to an animation studio in India that was going to do the CGI work. Because often that part is outsourced because it's cheaper to get it made in other countries. So if they had already gotten to the point where they had sent the project off to India, that means that at this point they had probably finished the concept art and the storyboards and the script and the voiceover. It's possible that they weren't done with all of that. Animation is a little bit weird. Things will often happen out of order. So like they'll start a project, start animating it, change the story, animate different things. It's not as clear of an order of operations. I believe the documentary about the making of Frozen 2 kind of touches on this of like changing things and reworking things throughout the production, which is also what happened with Tinkerbell. So at this point, Cher Morrill asked John Laster to take a look at the project because the Pixar merger had just happened and John Laster was now the head of Walt Disney Feature Animation. And that was sort of the professional thing to do to show your boss what projects your studio is working on. Some sources frame this as like, Sharon was worried about the plot of the movie and she wanted advice. I guess that's possible, but later on she seems very reluctant to make changes to the plot, which makes me question whether she actually wanted plot advice, especially since this story was her idea. But I don't know, maybe. So she showed us a draft of the movie to John Lasseter, Bob Iger, and Dick Cook, who was the chairman of Disney at this point. And allegedly Bob Iger and Dick Cook were like, looks good. It seems like it's 80 to 90% complete, so it'll be ready in time for its fall 2007 release. Which, if that's true, that's crazy. First of all, that the CEO of Disney saw it and was fine with it, but it still ended up being scrapped and changed. And also, if it was 90% done, which is so close to being done. I feel like most of the time with canceled projects and scrapped projects, it's in sort of the early stages. Like the Disney Princess Enchanted Tales. It was almost done, so they released it. The rest of the planned films were not almost done, so they were scrapped. But I think it's much more normal for if a project is almost done to just release it and not cancel it. Because at that point, it's a real waste of your investment. But meanwhile, John Lasseter hates it. <laughs> he has extensive notes. Now, why did John Lasseter hate it? What were his notes? Well, in order to explain that, I have to explain the plot of the movie, which I have not done yet. So let's do that. <laughs> so this is going to be based on the animated previews on the Disney DVD releases, animatics that are online, and art, like concept art and storyboards, which I mostly found archived on a Tumblr blog called Art of Disney Fairies, which if you're interested in this topic, you should go and just scroll through that blog. I think I spent like hours on there. <laughs> I'm also going to be using some written material, like the Tinkerbell Wiki, the Lost Media Wiki, and articles which were written at the time talking about the production of this movie. There's this one specific article, which was written by a now defunct media company that I found archived on the Wayback Machine. There was like a link to it in the Lost Media Wiki, and there's a lot of great information in that, most of which is corroborated by other sources. I've made like basically like a poor man's annotated bibliography. It's a Google doc with like links to all of the different sources and bullet pointed underneath those links, the information that I took from those sources. And so I'm going to link that Google doc in the description so you have all of my sources. So that's my disclaimer as to 
where I got any of this information. So in Ring of Belief, the fairies still all live together in Pixie Hollow, but there's some pretty big changes from the books. So they don't get pixie dust from Mother Dove and they don't all live together in the home tree. I think they probably got rid of the home tree pretty early on in this process because it's basically just like a whimsical apartment complex. Like it's more fun if all of the fairies live in their own unique little homes. And I think they got rid of Mother Dove pretty early on too, because she's like kind of a weird concept. And I think it's easier to buy into Mother Dove when she's just like a book character and you don't have to see her move and talk, which I think would have been a harder sell. So I think she was probably cut very early. I did find one piece of concept art that like kind of implies that Mother Dove existed. There's a lot of pieces of concept art of this like magical book, which I never really figured out what that was or what it was going to be for but there is multiple different pieces of art of different versions of this book. And one of the versions has like captions next to the different drawings. So I think this must have been taken from like the artist's website or something. And one of the captions mentions that the book has a feather taken from Mother Dove herself. And that's the only mention I found of Mother Dove, which I would love to be a fly on the wall for the conversations where they decided to cut this weird bird. So instead of Mother Dove, there's a pixie dust tree that makes pixie dust and it's sort of in the center of pixie hollow. I think that's probably part of the reason why they got rid of the home tree because it would be weird if there's like the pixie dust tree and the home tree. Something interesting to note is that there were still fairy books being put out while this movie was in production and so there are elements of the movie that are put into these books to sort of set the groundwork of the ideas that were going to be in the movies. So multiple books from this time have art of the pixie dust tree. And the way they explain it is that in ancient fairy times, before the events of the chapter books, there is a pixie dust tree that was destroyed. One book very vaguely attributes this to like a darkness, while another book says it was destroyed in a battle. And then Mother Dove came after that. So they wanted the movies to be different from the books, but still have them exist in the same universe. So they had them exist many years apart to explain the differences. And since the movies are an origin story of Tinkerbell, the movies are way earlier in the timeline and the chapter books are much later. And it's interesting to use the Disney fairies books to sort of track the changes that were happening with the Tinkerbell movie. So the pixie dust tree in Ring of Belief looks different than the pixie dust tree in the final released Tinkerbell movie. And the book illustrations look like the pixie dust tree from Ring of Belief because the books were made when they were still working on that movie. So pixie dust tree instead of Mother Dove and the home tree. And then Tinkerbell has four main friends. Each have a different talent. There's Rosetta, who's a garden talent fairy. She can like make flowers bloom. Iridessa, who's a light talent fairy. She can like bend sunlight. There's Fawn, who's an animal talent fairy. She can like communicate with animals. And there's Silvermist, who's a water talent fairy, and she can like manipulate water. These fairies were put into one of the chapter books and they have very early designs. Most obviously Fawn is wearing purple, which she wears purple in a lot of the very early movie concept art because she originated as a side character in the books who wore purple. Then their designs were finalized for Ring of Belief. Fawn wears orange and each of the girls' color palettes is simplified. I think they learned from the Disney Princess brand that it's easier for kids to identify characters when they have a signature color. When Ring of Belief was scrapped in favor of the released Tinkerbell movie, they did one last redesign where Iridessa goes from this pale yellow two-piece to a sunflower dress. But this was such a last minute change that she still wears the old outfit in the final trailer, some merchandise, and for the meet and greet character in the parks which I'm guessing all that stuff was already made and it was too late to change it. So those are our main characters. In the voiceover from one of the animated previews, Rosetta, Fawn, and Iridessa are all introduced. There is Iridessa, the sparkling light fairy. Rosetta, the beautiful garden fairy. Fawn, the fun-loving animal fairy. But Silvermist's introduction is, she's the glue that holds this group of girls together. And Silvermist, she's the glue that keeps this group of girls together. And it's been theorized that Silvermist was originally going to have a much bigger role in this movie. She was going to be best friends with Tinkerbell. There's a lot of like storyboards of her and Tinkerbell together. 
So Tinkerbell has these four friends and they're all going to fairy school together. They are training to be wing maidens. Wing maidens travel to the human world. We call it the mainland because Neverland is an island. And so the human world would be the mainland. And the wing maidens inspire and bring imagination to human children. It is the mission of every fairy to become a wing maiden and spread imagination to the children of the world by using pixie dust. Because human children's belief in fairies is what keeps fairies alive. This concept traces all the way back to the original Peter Pan J.M. Barry play, which I don't actually know all that much about, considering all of my fairy knowledge. But there is that thing of like, Tinkerbell is dying and you have to clap to show that you believe in Tinkerbell and that like brings her back to life. So it's this idea that humans, specifically human children, keep fairies alive by believing in them. And then it's sort of a symbiotic relationship. Children keep fairies alive with their belief and fairies bring imagination to children. This is the so-called ring of belief. We're pretty sure that the ring of belief is not an actual physical ring, like a wedding ring, because considering it was the title of the movie, I feel like there would have been like concept art of this ring, but I don't think it's an actual physical ring. It's like a metaphor. I would compare it to like the circle of life, like the natural balance and harmony of magic, human children and fairies. One of the Disney fairies books from this time has a page explaining the ring of belief and it definitely seems to imply that it's an abstract concept of the relationship between humans and fairies and not like a ring that you wear. I would like to note that human children believing in fairies is a concept that features pretty heavily in both the Gail Carson Levine books and to a lesser extent the chapter books. So they were definitely already utilizing this concept of human children keeping fairies alive by believing in them. So this idea is not like unique to this movie. It predates this movie by quite a bit. I just think it's important to mention that because it does seem a little bit random. But the fairies go to this fairy school to learn how to inspire children and be wing maidens. And when they graduate this school, they earn their pixie dust, which is a little bit confusing to me because in all of the books and the Tinkerbell movies that ended up being released, Fairies need pixie dust in order to fly and perform magic. But it seems like in this Ring of Belief movie, fairies could do that without pixie dust. Like there's a storyboard of them in fairy school before they've graduated and earned their pixie dust and they are like flying around and performing magic. So maybe the pixie dust mainly has to do with the mainland and the human children. I'm not sure. But the idea of having to earn pixie dust comes up in a lot of different sources. So we have a storyboard of the fairies in this fairy school. The teacher is a fairy named Fairy Mary. A version of this character ended up in the final released Tinkerbell movie, but in Ring of Belief she was a school teacher. And there's a storyboard where she is like getting the class to settle down and then having them practice using their magic to inspire a human child by using these like human child dolls. All of the fairies have a doll and they're using whatever their type of magic is to practice inspiring children. And there's another storyboard where Iridessa, who is a very high strung character, which carries over to her characterization in the final released Tinkerbell movies. And in this version, she's a very like studious bookworm teacher's pet, as well as being very anxious. So there's a storyboard where she's worried that she'll end up in a situation where there isn't any light and so she won't be able to use light to inspire a human child. And Tinkerbell and Silvermist are telling her to calm down and she's going to do fine. This next part of the story is a little bit confusing to me because I feel like there's conflicting information as to how this plot point would have gone. So I'm going to present different hypothetical versions. So the first way this story could have gone is that the fairies are in fairy school they have their test to see if they graduate and become wing maidens. And Tinkerbell's friends all pass, but Tinkerbell does not pass. And so she does not earn her pixie dust. And then Tinkerbell decides that she's going to steal some pixie dust. And then another part that I'm unclear on is that maybe her friends helped her steal this pixie dust, or maybe they didn't. Because I feel like different sources imply different things. 
So Tink, or Tink and her friends, attempt to steal some pixie dust, but then it disappears. And I think what we mean by that is like all of the pixie dust disappears. Like there's no pixie dust left. By attempting to steal it, we've like messed up the balance of magic. And so now the pixie dust is gone. Something that pretty consistently comes up about the plot of this movie is that Tinkerbell would have broken the ring of belief somehow. And then she has to figure out a way to fix it. And so probably stealing the pixie dust is what breaks the ring of belief because now there's no pixie dust and the human children on the mainland begin to lose their belief in fairies and lose their imagination and fairies are starting to disappear. We have a finished piece of animation from one of the trailers where Tink looks at her hand and it's like starting to fade away. And so the fairies have to somehow fix this and restore the ring of belief before all of the fairies disappear. And in the sources that mention that her friends were involved with stealing the pixie dust. It says that then Tinkerbell and her friends are given individual quests to try and fix the ring of belief, which I don't think I've found anything that supports that. Like, I don't think I've found any storyboards that suggest that the fairies are doing quests, but maybe, I don't know. We do have a storyboard of Tinkerbell and her friends sitting and looking upset guilty maybe. Fairy Mary is there and she's upset with them. And then Queen Clarion comes and this storyboard doesn't write out the full lines of dialogue. So we have like the first three words and then an ellipses, which is unhelpful for my purposes. But Queen Clarion says to Tinkerbell, today I told you to place your dot dot dot. You broke that trust in the worst possible way. So I feel like that storyboard could have been Tinkerbell and her friends stole the pixie dust and now Fairy Mary and Queen Clarion are disappointed in all of them. Because if the friends weren't involved, then why would they be there for this? But then I do feel like there are some sources that to me imply that Tinkerbell stole the pixie dust alone. There's an animatic that you can find online where Tinkerbell says, I broke the ring of belief. I broke the ring of belief. Implying that it is mostly or entirely her fault. And then I feel like there's some sources that imply that Tinkerbell did get her pixie dust, but then it got like taken away or something else went wrong. We have finished animation in the trailer of Tinkerbell and her friends all getting pixie dust from Queen Clarion. That could either be they graduated and have earned their pixie dust and Queen Clarion is giving it to them. Or it could be like at the end of the movie, after the Ring of Belief has been broken and subsequently repaired as part of the resolution of the movie, Queen Clarion gives them all pixie dust again because now the pixie dust is back. Then there's a storyboard where Tinkerbell's friends are like waiting for her and Tinkerbell is like in a meeting with Queen Clarion and it seems like Tinkerbell has done something wrong and Queen Clarion is upset with her. And Iridessa is trying to calm Silver Mist down. And she's like, well, what's the worst that could happen? And Fawn, very unhelpfully, is like, well, Queen Clarion could revoke her graduation, take away her pixie dust, and banish her from Pixie Hollow. Which that implies that Tinkerbell did graduate and did earn her pixie dust, but now has done something wrong that might negate that. So maybe she wanted to steal more pixie dust? I don't know. Then there's the orphans. A seemingly big part of this movie would have been multiple orphan characters who live together in an orphanage in London. And this is kind of like Peter Pan era London. So like 1800s, the skyline and the buildings look kind of like Peter Pan. And so there's quite a bit of material that is concept art of London, of the orphans, of the orphanage, and then storyboards of the fairies interacting with the orphans. And there seems to be one main orphan girl named Victoria. There's a finished animation in a lot of those preview trailers where the fairies are sort of flying around this little girl and they put a flower crown on her head. That would have been Victoria. And so this sort of ties into the plot of losing the ring of belief because now these orphans are starting to lose their sense of imagination and their happiness. And so fixing the Ring of Belief probably had to do with Tinkerbell interacting with Victoria in some way. I think that there might have been multiple different trips of the fairies going to this orphanage in London. I'm thinking like they go while they're still wing maidens in training because there's a finished piece of animation that I think was a deleted scene 
DVD extra on the finished, released Tinkerbell movie DVD. The scene you're about to watch was designed around Tinkerbell and all of her friends' first trip to the mainland. But as our story evolved, it became more about Tinkerbell and her first trip to the mainland. So we opted to take this shot out because it did include all five girls going to the mainland. And to me, this scene very much looks like it was from Ring of Belief and they were maybe hoping to repurpose it in some way, but then it didn't work out because it's Tinkerbell and her friends and Fairy Mary dressed in the all purple outfit that she wore in Ring of Belief. And it's this very lighthearted tone of like, Iridessa is nervous. They never taught us this part. They, do we fly straight in? Do, do, we, do we close our eyes, give a password? <gasps> what if there's a password? Oh, is this gonna mess up my hair? Come on, slow poke. Last one on the other side, suck the front legs. But then they all get there and they have a lot of fun interacting with different human things, like a horse-drawn carriage and a street lamp. And so I think that this would have happened earlier on in the Ring of Belief movie, while they are still in school to be wing maidens, but they're like practicing traveling to the mainland and maybe practicing interacting with children. And this is when we first meet the orphans and Tinkerbell first meets Victoria. And then later, once the Ring of Belief is broken, they have to go back to the mainland to try and fix it. Because there's just so much material of these orphans and that finished piece of animation really feels like before the Ring of Belief was broken. So I think it was two separate trips. And then the last element of the Ring of Belief movie is the pirates and Peter Pan and the Lost Boys. So we don't really know how they would have tied into the movie as a whole because I don't think they really would have been involved while Tinkerbell and her friends are in fairy school. There's just some storyboards of Peter Pan and the Lost Boys and the pirates and specifically Captain Hook that don't really have the fairies in them. They seem pretty separate. But then we know that towards the end of Ring of Belief, the Lost Boys and Peter Pan are captured in London and held on like a barge, like a ship. And there is concept art of this barge and there's storyboards that look similar to the art of the barge. So these storyboards were probably taking place on this barge where there's like a shadowy figure in the doorway and you can kind of see a hook. So it was probably Captain Hook who captured them. And also Silver Mist and Tinkerbell are like trapped inside of a lantern, like the glass box kind of lantern. And so for some reason, Captain Hook captures Peter Pan, the Lost Boys, Silver Mist and Tinkerbell and is holding them on a barge in London, sort of towards the end of the movie. And I don't necessarily have a lot of great theories for that. I think that the idea of the Tinkerbell movies in general was to provide a backstory for Tinkerbell. So I think that Ring of Belief was going to also try and provide a backstory for Peter Pan and the Lost Boys and Captain Hook. What makes sense to me is that this is maybe before Captain Hook has gone to Neverland. And so my like headcanon theory is that Captain Hook is in London because he's like from London, like he went to Eton College, right? And he somehow learns about Neverland or learns about magic or something. And he wants to go to Neverland and wants to have magic for his own nefarious purposes. And so he somehow finds Peter Pan and the fairies and captures them in the hopes that he will somehow get pixie dust from them or figure out a way to get to Neverland. That makes the most sense to me for why this would have happened. And I would guess that at this point, the ring of belief is already broken. And so the fairies are fading away and they don't have any pixie dust and they're trying to fix it. But Tinkerbell and Silver Mist getting captured is like another obstacle. They're running out of time and now they're captured. So we've wasted even more time. In that animatic I brought up from earlier, the animatic starts with Silver Mist and Tinkerbell being held in a glass lantern and their other friends come and break them out. But there's some bigger problem that we need to solve because Silver Mist is like, where's Queen Clarion? We need her help to like fix something else. And the other fairies are like, she's already disappearing. She can't help us. Oh, are you okay? Did you get help? Where's the queen? Where's Queen Clarion? There's nothing she can do. You're supposed to get help. Where is she? It's too late. What? She's starting to disappear. Disappear? It was horrible. Can't be happening. 
Tinkerbell's the only one who can fix all this. You were right, Syl. No. She has to do she it. She can't do it. I was wrong. It's all over. And then Tinkerbell is like, I broke the ring of belief. I have to fix this. Now I have to mend it. I have to. But I can't do it without pixie dust. So she asks her friends to give her their pixie dust. I can't do it without pixie dust. Take mine. So she doesn't have pixie dust. Either she never got it in the first place or she had it taken away. And so Tinkerbell and her friends all join hands and they give Tinkerbell their pixie dust and then her friends fade away. So now it's just Tinkerbell left, leaving her to try and somehow fix this on her own. Which separate from these storyboards and this animatic, it is written specifically in that one archived article that in the original plot of Ring of Belief, Peter Pan and the Lost Boys are captured and all of the fairies die. And so I think this sort of supports that. I believe at some point Tinkerbell also fades away. I didn't really find art or storyboards of that, but that article does say the fairies, even Tinkerbell, disappear. And then I think on the Tinkerbell wiki, it says that there's a scene where Tinkerbell fades away, but then she comes back. So I think it's one of those things where like, she tries to fix the ring of belief, probably by interacting with Victoria, but then we think, oh no, it's too late. She didn't fix it in time and she fades away and we think, oh no, all the pixie dust is lost and all of the characters are kidnapped or disappeared into oblivion, but it's a fake out and then Tinkerbell and everybody comes back. And so that scene from a lot of the previews where Queen Clarion gives Tinkerbell and her friends pixie dust, that could be from the end of the movie after Tinkerbell comes back. Queen Clarion gives Tinkerbell and all of her friends pixie dust because like, in the process of disappearing and coming back, they like lost their pixie dust or something. I think it's possible that that's what that scene could have been. And so I think that's like the overall plot. Fairy school to be wing maidens. Tinkerbell doesn't graduate or she does, but then has her graduation revoked. She or possibly her and her friends try and steal pixie dust, but that sort of upsets the balance of magic. And now they have to go to the mainland and fix it, probably by encouraging the orphan's belief in fairies. Tinkerbell and Silver Mist get sidetracked because they are captured by Captain Hook, who has his own nefarious plan, but they are freed by their friends. Tinkerbell is given their pixie dust so that she can try and fix the ring of belief. She almost doesn't do it in time, but then she does happily ever after. Here's some other random things from the storyboards and the concept art. There's a couple pieces of art and storyboard that seem to imply that there would have been like other magical creatures. I'm guessing those probably got cut pretty early on because I don't know how that would have tied into the plot. And then there's a lot of storyboards and stuff that seem to imply that Tinkerbell was a bad student. There's art of her like about to punch another fairy in the face and she plays lots of pranks. She convinced the Whispering Woods to say insults to Fairy Mary, and she painted spots on the mirrors and switched Winifred's shampoo with crabgrass. Winifred is a character who comes up occasionally. She's in that Fairy Mary classroom storyboard. Some materials show tension between Iridessa and Tinkerbell because Iridessa is a very serious student and does not like that Tink is a troublemaker. One storyboard implies that they used to be friends when they were younger, but have since drifted apart. According to Lisa Temming's portfolio, Silvermist and Rosetta were among the first characters that were invented for this Disney Fairies brand. So all the way back when it was just going to be a toy line, they had the idea for Silvermist and Rosetta. They became side characters in the books and then became main characters in the movies. And throughout that, their designs went pretty much unchanged. Meanwhile, Fawn is a minor character in the books. Iridessa does not really show up anywhere until they started development for the movies. So like in the books that mention the pixie dust tree, that's when Iridessa first shows up. Two main characters from the books, Vidya and Terrence, were not in this Ring of Belief movie, but they did end up in the final release Tinkerbell movie. So at some point they decided to add them back in from the books. Oh, and also Tinkerbell talks. 
and all the fairies talk. And you're just gonna have to get over that if you grew up with the Peter Pan movie. There's a lot of articles where these bloggers are like confused. Like, when did Tinkerbell learn how to talk? Did she lose that later on? And it's like, maybe because I grew up with the books and not the Peter Pan movie, it always made complete sense to me that Tinkerbell and the fairies can talk to each other, but they can't talk to humans. Humans just can't understand them. But that was a pretty big change from the Peter Pan movie that people seem to have a big problem with. So that's sort of my reconstruction of Ring of Belief based on all the materials that we have that have been made public. That's my guess of what the plot would have been and sort of the look of the movie. So, Laster saw a draft of this movie, which was allegedly maybe 80 to 90% done, which I would guess means that like some of the lighting and the textures weren't done, the models of the characters were made, but they hadn't been like fully rigged yet. I don't actually know that much about CGI animation, so I'm going to stop talking. But Laster saw it, and he hated it. And it seems like the main point of contention was he didn't like how much of the movie took place in London, and he didn't like that Peter Pan and the Lost Boys were in the movie. He did not want audiences to see these iconic characters in this iconic location animated in CGI with a completely different story, and then compare this movie negatively to the original Peter Pan movie. So we didn't want audiences to see a CGI Peter Pan getting captured on a London barge and think it was stupid. Which I kind of agree with him, not for like a character integrity reason, not because I'm afraid that Ring of Belief would have ruined Peter Pan, but just because I don't really like Peter Pan. I think that the big weakness of Tinkerbell is that she is inextricably linked to Peter Pan. If I had my way, Tinkerbell would be completely independent in her own little bubble, separate from London and Neverland and Peter Pan and pirates. She's just a fairy living with her friends in a magical world. Don't worry about any of the Peter Pan stuff. And Lasseter also allegedly said, fairies don't bring imagination, criticizing the whole wing maiden plot, which like is a hilarious thing to say. It's like saying unicorns don't bring happiness. Like, what are you talking about, John? None of this is real. Also, it is based on the Peter Pan lore and the existing Disney fairies books to have the fairies need the belief of children in order to not disappear. Like, this isn't some new outlandish concept made up for this movie. So he definitely didn't like the Peter Pan and London elements and maybe also didn't like the whole Wing Maiden plot, which, like... Dude, that's all of the movie. The movie's almost done. It's too late for that. Allegedly, a Disney Toon executive said, we can only change 50% of this movie and still have it ready for a fall 2007 release. Like, with the amount that we have done and the amount of time we have left, we can't overhaul the whole thing. And I think that definitely the Wing Maiden stuff is too woven in. Like, that's the whole plot. I think London and the Orphans were a pretty considerable amount of the runtime. I think you maybe could have cut out Peter Pan, and so maybe just Silvermist and Tinkerbell get captured by some rando, not Captain Hook, or we just cut out the getting captured in the first place, and then I think that would sort of get rid of a lot of the Peter Pan presence, but who knows, maybe he was more present in the beginning of the movie, and I just don't have any sources for that. But I think you could make some changes that would make Lasseter happy, but he seemed to have just fundamentally disagreed with this entire movie, which I don't know. Allegedly, John Lasseter and Bob Iger watched this draft. Bob Iger is the CEO, and if he was cool with it, maybe we don't have to change it. Maybe it's not a big deal. And then a lot of sources say that Sharon Morrill agreed to make these changes, but secretly had the studio continue working on Ring of Belief, which I don't really understand how that could have worked. First of all, the movie was allegedly almost done, so I don't really understand how much more work we needed on it. I don't know if the Disney Toon studio in California was still working on it, or if it was at a point where it was sort of all up to the studio in India, and then I don't understand what she had agreed to change because it couldn't have been all of his changes because we know that was too extensive, so it wouldn't have been ready in time. 
So was there agreement to make some of the changes to have it ready in time? Or was the agreement to do all of the changes and push the release date? And then I don't know what her end game was, because let's say you have your studio in California or your studio in India or both continue working on Ring of Belief, which it's almost done. So then you finish it. And then what? Do you go to Bob Iger and say, hey, look, this isn't what John Laster wanted, but it's done. So we may as well put it out. Or was she just hoping that John Laster would change his mind? like see that there wasn't enough time and go, okay, let's just use your version. And then she could say, great, because my version is almost done. And then the next problem is that the Tinkerbell movies were always meant to be a franchise. So there was gonna be Ring of Belief and then there was a proposed trilogy that would have followed that. And so after Lasseter saw this Ring of Belief draft, didn't like it, they maybe agreed to do some changes, but Sharon was lying and was actually still working on Ring of Belief. Then Sharon had to do a pitch to John Lasseter of what her proposed trilogy would be that would follow Ring of Belief, or I guess the Lasseter cut of Ring of Belief. And this part of the story is not mentioned in very many places. This came up in that archived article that I found. And at first I fully didn't believe it was real. I was like, what are you talking about, first of all? Second of all, this isn't really mentioned anywhere else, so I have nothing to prove that it's real. And also it's just such a crazy pitch that I don't believe this happened. So allegedly, the first film of this trilogy would be Tinkerbell finding out that there are boy fairies in Neverland. Before this, all of the fairies were female, but it turns out that all of the boy fairies had been banished to another part of Neverland. And I was like, what? But then all of the characters in Ring of Belief are girl fairies. There's not any boy fairies. And the title Wing Maidens is a female gendered term. So, okay. And then one of Tink's friends ends up falling in love with a boy fairy. And there ends up being a fairy war, which I think could maybe be the battle that we said destroyed the pixie dust tree and the boy sacrifices himself for Tink's friend. And then Tinkerbell and her friends go to a concert by an all-girl fairy band, which was allegedly referred to at Disney Toon as the Pixie Chicks. And then in the second and third films, we find out that the boy fairy isn't actually dead. We resolve the conflict between the girl and boy fairies, and we all live happily ever after. And I read this and I was like, no way. <laughs> because it seems just so disconnected from Ring of Belief, which Sharon Morrill was very passionate about Ring of Belief. She didn't want to change it. It was her story. So it seemed crazy that her follow-up trilogy would be so unrelated to Ring of Belief. It seems so disconnected and there's nothing else that supports that this existed except for maybe that all of the fairies in Ring of Belief were girls, which could be interpreted as an all-girl fairy society. But then I found a snippet of animation of an all-girl fairy band performing a concert. And there's a storyboard where Tink and her friends are going to a concert and a character who we don't know, presumably the friend who falls in love with the boy fairy, goes up on stage to sing with the band. Also, Iridessa finds the missing page of a book that she's been looking for and it seems to be about battles. And I was like, okay, so I think these are the pixie chicks and this is the concert, which validates at least that element of this article. So maybe that whole pitch was real. I mean, it's possible that this fairy band is separate, like it was part of a different pitch, and the whole like fairy war, gender segregation, Romeo and Juliet plot was unrelated. I feel like that's still kind of unsubstantiated by the evidence that I have. But I don't know, I think at least some elements of it are real and was part of an actual pitch. Cause it seems like too much of a coincidence for this article to say, this was the pitch for the follow-up trilogy and for elements of that pitch to be real. 
that would be a weird coincidence. I think it does mean that this pitch was real. And so, unsurprisingly, John Lasseter hated this pitch. He allegedly stormed out of the screening and people at Disney Toon were concerned that he would try and get the studio shut down because he already didn't like them or any of the projects they had ever released. And he was already butting heads with Sharon Marill on this Tinkerbell movie. And so I think seeing this pitch of the direction this franchise was headed, he really hated it. And that sort of confirmed for him that what Disney Toon was doing was bad and that Sharon and her ideas for Tinkerbell were bad. There's a quote that comes up a lot that John Laster said that the version of Tinkerbell that he saw was, quote, virtually unwatchable. I think it's possible he was saying that about Ring of Belief, but I also think it's possible he was saying it about this trilogy pitch. And then allegedly, the very next day, Laster had a meeting with Sharon Morrill and the current director of Tinkerbell, Bradley Raymond, and the two of them were going to present their ideas for how to fix the Tinkerbell movie. So their pitches for how to change Ring of Belief based on his notes. Which again is a little bit confusing because haven't we already started on a version based on his notes? That's the whole working on one version to appease John Laster, but still working on the original version of Ring of Belief. Because sources do talk about like, allegedly John Laster would come and visit the studio and they would show him his version, but they were secretly still working on Ring of Belief. So I did think that at this point in the story, we have been working on a John Laster approved version, but I don't know, maybe they hadn't gotten very far into that or he didn't like that version either and he wanted to get some other ideas. So he wanted pitches from Cher Morrill and Bradley Raymond. Bradley Raymond was directing Ring of Belief, which then turned into the final release Tinkerbell movie. He had been a director at Disney Toon. He directed Pocahontas 2, colon, Journey to a New World, The Hunchback of Notre Dame 2, and The Lion King 1 and a half. And so Bradley Raymond pitched his idea and Laster really liked it, but it would require them to scrap about 90% of Ring of Belief. And then Sharon Morrill did a pitch of like, here's what we could feasibly do with all of the assets and work that we have already and the amount of time we have left. And so obviously it did not deviate from Ring of Belief that much. And so Laster did not like that pitch. And he allegedly said that he would not support a movie with Peter Pan in it. So we scrapped Ring of Belief. And then we started working on Bradley Raymond's pitch, which would turn into the final released Tinkerbell movie. And then according to this article, even when they decided to scrap Ring of Belief, they had the studio in India keep working on it because if they canceled it, they would still have to pay out the contract. So like it wouldn't be saving any money by having them stop working on it. And then they hoped that they would be able to reuse some of it, which if that's true, does that mean that the studio in India finished Ring of Belief? Like there's a finished version of Ring of Belief sitting on a hard drive somewhere? That's crazy. And then John Lasseter had Brittany Murphy replaced with Mae Whitman. Mae Whitman voiced Katara in Avatar The Last Airbender, which I did not watch, but I know is beloved. So I feel like that's an important credit for me to mention. And so the story of this new Tinkerbell movie was obviously very different from Ring of Belief. These were changing 90% of it. It involves the fairies being responsible for the changing of the seasons on the mainland. So like at the beginning of every season, the fairies have to travel to the mainland and like make the flowers bloom and paint the spots on the ladybugs and kickstart all of the changes to nature that happens when the seasons change. In one article, Raymond said that working with Lassiter was like a dream come true and that Lassiter created the idea that fairies go to the mainland and change the seasons, which is interesting to me. I feel like the story beats of the fairies changing the seasons on the mainland is very similar to the fairies being wing maidens and inspiring children on the mainland. Because in both Ring of Belief and the released Tinkerbell movie, the fairies have to go to the mainland to do an important job, but Tinkerbell isn't allowed to go. And so she sort of breaks the rules trying to figure out a way that she can go. And by doing that kind of stupid thing, she ruins everything. And now all the fairies are kind of in trouble 
and she has to fix it. But she does fix it, and so in the end she gets to go to the mainland. And she interacts with a human girl, which in the released Tinkerbell movie is Wendy from Peter Pan. Mommy, guess what? Guess what? Yes, Wendy, what is it, darling? And so this plot makes John Laster feel hypocritical to me. Because, like, you're okay with the fairies bringing seasons to the mainland, but not imagination? I feel like the seasons thing is just the wing maidens thing, but with less basis in the existing lore. Also, you're fine with Wendy getting a cameo? So, like, there's an amount of Peter Pan that Laster would have been okay with in the movies. He just wasn't okay with the extent to which the Peter Pan characters were involved in the Ring of Belief. One of the movies in the Tinkerbell franchise is like an origin story of Captain Hook. Lasseter was okay with that, I guess. There was a cancelled seventh film in the series that was going to have Tinkerbell meeting Peter Pan. Now it was cancelled, but I don't think it's because John Lasseter didn't like it, it was because the entire studio shut down because they stopped making money. So like, I won't support a movie with Peter Pan in it. Really? Did you change your mind on that? So to recap the behind the scenes drama, Disney Toon Studios made buckets of money for Disney as overseen by Sharon Morrill. Then she and her team made a Tinkerbell movie, almost finished it. Then John Laster comes in and is able to get the whole thing scrapped because he did not want Peter Pan in a movie about Tinkerbell, the famous Peter Pan character. And then he had a different version of the movie made, which is, in many ways, quite similar to the movie he just scrapped. And, like, articles from this time, around 2007 to 2008, talking about the production of Tinkerbell, all talk about how John Laster came in and saved the Tinkerbell movie. John Laster was quoted as saying it was virtually unwatchable, and everyone just takes his word for it. And they're like, well, we love John Laster, because we love Pixar. So I'm sure that Tinkerbell movie must have been a real stinker. How nice of him to come in and fix it. And then the final version of the Tinkerbell movie comes out and everyone's like, well, I mean, it's not good, but imagine how much worse it would have been if John Laster didn't get involved. And a lot of articles mention that the reason the original was scrapped was because it was skewing too young and the story was too juvenile and they wanted the Tinkerbell franchise to appeal to girls older than the target demographic for the princesses. Which I think is not true at all. Because the original Ring of Belief is, if anything, too dark. I don't think it would have appealed to very little kids. I think it would have appealed to an older demographic. I don't know the source for this alleged reason that Ring of Belief was scrapped, but I think it's made up. And also, I watched the final version of Tinkerbell, and I don't think it's very good. I don't think we, like, got a masterpiece. I don't think it was worth it to scrap Ring of Belief because the movie we got instead was so great. I think they both would have been bad in different ways, but I think that scrapping Ring of Belief is so wasteful and disrespectful of everybody's time. You see this number thrown around that Disney had to scrap 30 million dollars worth of animation and like I don't think it was worth it to scrap 30 million dollars worth of animation. I think it would have been fine if you kept it the way it is. I think it probably would have been equal in quality, at least story-wise. I think the animation that we've seen from Ring of Belief does look more polished, I think because the final Tinkerbell movie was so rushed. To be clear, I don't want to make it seem like I think that we lost out on some amazing Tinkerbell movie because Ring of Belief was scrapped. I think it would have had its own problems, but I think that scrapping a movie to make a similar and equally flawed, if in some ways worse movie, was a waste of time and money. The final part of this story is that then Sharon Morrill was fired. Well, I mean, she was moved to a different department because they didn't want to buy out her contract, but she was removed from her job. And then a few months later, no longer worked at Disney. And basically everybody agrees that conflicts with John Laster over the Tinkerbell movie is why she was fired. Which I also don't want this to come across as, I think that Sharon Morrill was some sort of hapless victim 
I think she didn't handle the production well, even before John Laster came on, going through a dozen directors and two dozen scripts. And then once John Laster came on, I don't think she acted as professionally as she should have. I think that Tinkerbell became sort of a passion project for her, and so she was not willing to compromise or play nice. If she was smart or less emotionally invested, she should have gone, okay, this is what my boss wants me to do with this movie, so I'm going to try and make it happen and not go behind his back or argue with him. But there's a part of me that still feels like John Lasseter just was not into her version of the movie at all. I think it's possible that there's an alternate universe where she did play nice and make changes and he still just wasn't into it. I don't want to turn this into like a sexism thing, but we do know that John Laster famously has problems respecting women in the workplace and he meets this female executive, disagrees with her on every element of her project, and the second a man comes in with a different idea, he's all for it. I don't know. I might be reading into it, but I think it probably didn't help that Shara Morrill was a woman, you know? So that's the story of Ring of Belief. I think it's a really unique story just because of how much drama and fighting there was behind the scenes and also because of how much material we have from this scrapped movie. I'm not a huge lost media person, but I feel like it is uncommon to have so much public material. I think it's in part because it was so close to being completed, which I think is a shame. I'm very curious as to what Ring of Belief would have been like, because you saw my plot reconstruction, there's still a lot of unanswered questions. And I also always feel bad with creative projects like this, because I feel like most of the work that an artist does for a company whether it's developing animation or a doll line, most of the time it never gets greenlit or it doesn't make it that far into production and it never sees the light of day. And so all this work that artists have worked so hard on and poured a lot of creativity and heart into just gets lost to time. And so I also just want to appreciate all of the art that we do have from Ring of Belief because especially a lot of the early Pixie Hollow concepts I think are just so beautiful. So if you happen to have worked on the Tinkerbell franchise and have any stories about it or any art sitting on your hard drive, please share it. I would love to hear more about this project. And um, if you have a copy of the movie sitting somewhere, email me. <laughs> um, I don't know how to end a YouTube video. So, bye. Also, I think John Laster is a creep.